Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Here ends the reading of God's word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts upon the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Someone asked the question last December during one of our Ask the Pastor sermons. The question had to do with Joseph who, after Jesus is born, basically disappears from the Gospels. So the person wanted to know what happened to Joseph. Now, fortunately, I was able to offer a deeply profound and theologically sound answer, which was, I don't know, beats the heck out of me. <laughs> what happened to Joseph is a mystery. And life has its mysteries. Now, one of the things that is nice about mysteries is they can help keep you humble. That was certainly the case for three men who went hunting in the wilds of northern Canada. As they were making their way through the woods, they came upon this old cabin. Inside the cabin, they were surprised to find a heavy wood stove burning from, hanging from the ceiling. Naturally, they wondered why the heavy wood-burning stove was hanging from the ceiling. Well, one of the men who happened to be a psychologist was the first to offer an explanation for the mystery. There's no doubt about it, he said. It's obvious that this lonely trapper, far removed from civilization, has elevated the stove so he can curl up underneath it and vicariously experience a return to the womb. Nonsense, said the second man, who happened to be an engineer. It's obvious that this trapper is practicing the laws of thermodynamics. By elevating the stove, he has found a way to distribute the heat more efficiently and evenly throughout the cabin. The third man, who happened to be a theologian, wasn't convinced. I'm not so sure, he said. In fact, I'm positive that this elevated stove has a deeper spiritually significant meaning. 
Fire lifted up to the heavens has been a religious symbol since the dawn of time. Well, the three men got into a heated argument as they were going back and forth. The trapper returned to the cabin, and they immediately asked him why the stove was hanging from the ceiling. The question puzzled the trapper. He just shrugged his shoulders and said, had plenty of wire, not much stovepipe. Sometimes, as you make your way along the path of life, you come face to face with a mystery. And when that happens, you may be tempted to ask that age-old question, why? That's the question that Job asked after he experienced all of those tragedies. Now, biblical scholars don't believe that Job was an actual person, which in a way is good because it makes it easier for us to identify with him. So Job was this good and righteous man who had all of these terrible tragedies happen to him. In a matter of just a few days, he lost everything. He lost all of his worldly possessions. He lost all of his loved ones. And he lost his health. So naturally, after going through all of that, Job wanted to know why. Why were all of these terrible tragedies happening to him? In a way, Job probably felt the same way that Paul Newman felt in the movie Cool Hand Luke. If you remember that movie, Newman plays a prisoner in that movie. And in this one particular scene, he's on his hands and knees in a mud puddle. And he looks up to the heavens and he cries out, love me, hate me, just let me know you're there. So Job has all of these terrible tragedies happen to him. And then things go from bad to worse when three of his friends show up. Now the names of the friends were Zophar, Eliphaz, and Bildad. Now, if you ever run into anyone with one of those names, my advice to you is run. <laughs> I say that because when it comes to Zophar, Eliphaz, and Bildad, the old saying is true. With friends like that, who needs enemies? You see, the free friends, instead of comforting Job, they attack him, they blame him. They basically say to him, Job, it's really simple. We know that God doesn't let good things happen to bad people. So all of these tragedies, these terrible tragedies have happened to you because you must be bad. You are being punished by God. Now put yourself in Job's shoes. Is that what you want to hear? It's the last thing that Job wanted to hear. And so he gets into this big argument with the friends. The argument goes on and on and on. It actually goes on for 35 chapters. Finally, Job decides that enough is enough. He basically says, I'm done with you flunkies. I want to talk to the only one who can answer my question. I want to talk to the only one who can tell me why all of these terrible tragedies have happened to me. I want to talk to God. And that brings us to the passage that we read just a few moments ago. Job issues an ultimatum. And after issuing that ultimatum, God appears to him in this whirlwind. And you quickly realize that it isn't going to go well for Job. Listen again to what God said to Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? I will question you, and you make it known to me. Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? That's the way it goes for a couple of chapters. 
And in the end, Job never gets the answer to his question. And that's what a mystery does to you. A mystery puts you in your place. A mystery keeps you humble. A mystery reminds you that you're not God, that you're human, and you don't know everything, and you don't understand everything. But fortunately, there is a God who created the heavens and the earth. There is a God who gave you the breath of life, and that God knows everything and understands everything. And just as it was for Job, that God is there to help you find healing and peace and hope when you come face to face with one of those mysteries that breaks your heart or leaves you scratching your head a little. You see, in a way, we're no different from a Yale student who was taking a course offered by Professor William Phelps. Professor Phelps taught at Yale many years ago. He taught for a total of 41 years. Well, one day in early December, Professor Phelps was grading some exams, and he got to the exam of this particular student. On the exam, he found a note that the student had written. The note said, only God knows the answer to this question. Merry Christmas. When the student got the exam back, he discovered that Professor Phelps had written a reply to his note. Underneath his note were the words, God gets an A, you get an F. Happy New Year. <laughs> so what happened to Job? I don't know. Beats the heck out of me. And that's OK because I want a faith that has some mystery to it. I want a faith that has some mystery to it because it reminds me that there is a God and I am only human. In the book, Small Miracles of Love and Friendship, a woman by the name of Julia Dixon tells a story about a mystery that she came face to face with one day after she accidentally locked herself out of her house. As she stood there by the front door trying to figure out what to do, the postal worker arrived with her mail. He could tell that something was amiss, so he asked her what was wrong. I don't know, she said. I don't know what I'm going to do. The door locked behind me, and my neighbor, who has a duplicate key, is out of town. The postal worker suggested that she call a locksmith. When he made that suggestion, she quickly pointed out that they charge an arm and a leg. And with everything that was going on in her life at that particular moment, she really didn't have a lot of extra money to share. The postal worker felt sorry for her, but pointed out that it was probably her only solution to the problem. As he was saying that, he reached into his mail bag and handed her her mail. As he did that, he whimsically said, who knows, maybe there'll be some good news in one of these letters that will cheer you up. After he left, Julia Dixon was looking through the mail, and she saw a letter from her brother, Jonathan. Now, Jonathan had visited her the week before and stayed a few days. So she was kind of surprised that he was writing to her so soon after his visit. She opened the letter, and when she did, a key fell into her hand. Dear Julia, he said, while I was visiting last week, I accidentally locked myself out of the house while you were shopping. I got the duplicate key from your neighbor, but forgot to return it to you. So I'm enclosing it in this letter. Yes, life is full of mysteries. But just remember that behind all of those mysteries is the greatest mystery of all. Behind all of those mysteries is the God who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. Behind all of life's mysteries is the God who is always there to help you find your way as you go along the path of life in this 
twisting, turning, up and down, sometimes crazy, chaotic world. And for that, we can give thanks. Amen.